Thank you and welcome. Um, on behalf of the State University of New York at Potsdam and the Crane School of Music, which is located there, it's a great pleasure to welcome you. And we're uh, very honored to uh, partner with NAM in honoring uh, the memory of uh, Sandy Feldstein, who was an alumnus of Crane and a member of our faculty. We're especially honored to have members of his family, his wife Wendy and daughter Tracy, are here with us today. Could we uh, honor them by uh, a round of applause? Let's see, here we are. So thank you for being here. It has seemed appropriate since we started doing this about 10 years ago and thinking about mentoring the next generation to uh, do it in, in Sandy's memory because he was a mentor to many, including many who are here today, and I'm sure you'll hear about that. So we're uh, pleased to be able to do this. And at this point, I'd like to welcome our friend uh, Joe Lamond, the CEO of NAM, who uh, will speak to you more about Sandy and moderate our session. Thank you, Joe. Okay, okay. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's Saturday afternoon at the NAM show. Hey, Wendy. How are we doing so far? How many of you have been all over the show floor today? How many of you have seen all two million square feet of exhibits? Liar. <laughs> Incredible show. We're so glad you're here to be with us. I think one of the things we're trying to accomplish today is something that uh, was very near and dear to Sandy Feldstein Hart, Sandy Feldstein's heart, which was to create the next generation of industry leaders. You are going to, the show that's being reinvented as we see now is being reinvented by people just like you or just a few older, years older than you out of school. My team, the people working for all the companies here, they're the ones reinventing the show. And I couldn't be more excited to just step out of the way and let them do their, let, let them do their thing. So that's the task you have ahead of you. How do we honor what has already been built since 1901, this NAM show? How do we respect the shoulders of people we stand on, yet at the same time take it where it needs to be, places we could never, never go? That was Sandy's dream in mentoring people, in leading, in trying to create that opportunity for each and every one of you. Now, on a more practical level, how many of you are college students right now? How many of you are going to be out of college very soon? How many of you are looking for gainful employment very soon? How many of your parents think they'd really like you to move out and find gainful employment right very soon? More hands, please. I'm a parent who's in the same boat. <laughs> this is about moving forward. This session is simply about moving forward, each and every one of you, in any path that you choose, but moving forward in a way that's smart, efficient, and gets you where you need to be quicker. Sandy was really big about why do you need to make all the mistakes that he made or others have made? Why don't you learn from the mistakes we made or why don't you learn from the things that some, someone has already done? I was just sharing with the, uh, some of the college kids who are here who won a very prestigious scholarship to be here at NAM. They have elicited some spark that we saw that said you are going to be one of the leaders. And one thing I shared with them is when you're in a position like mine, it has very little to do with knowing how to run all this. There is so much complexity here that is beyond my ability to run, but it still happens. And it happens because I didn't ask the question of how to do something. I simply asked the question, who could do it for me? Who could do it for us? Who's done it for others that can do it here? Who's done it better than we could have ever done it by ourselves? So don't ask how, ask who. That's how this is gonna get done. That's how this does get done. I wouldn't. So we brought some really cool people who are already in the field, working in this industry in various parts of it. And we thought if we asked them a couple of compelling questions, we could help clear some of the fog from your mind about how this works. How do I get into this industry? How do I find my path and follow my passion in this industry? So I'm gonna start with my first vict uh, guest, not victim, that's wrong. Um, we're gonna bring up Mary Keenan, who's director of Fender Play, their online amazing part of Fender. So where is Mary Keenan? Hi, Mary. Come on up. Are you ready? Mary, these are all my friends. Hello. These are here. Hello. So why don't you pull up a friends. seat, and I'm now going to start interrogating you with oh, some boy. insightful questions. Vic 
victim comment, I'm feeling which, which are really, again, designed to help these folks clear the fog away yeah. and figure out how do they enter this beautiful ecosystem that we're seeing here at the NAM show. So first of all, what was your path? How did you get to Fender? Well, I'm, uh, I'm glad that you asked that because I'm probably a little bit of an anomaly, or at least I feel that way. Uh, my background is education technology. I've worked in instructional design and uh, e-learning for 22 years wow. and uh, have moved uh, through all a variety of experiences with that, through K-12 education, through corporate education, workforce development. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fender uh, built, if anybody's been up to our booth, you might have seen Fender Play, which is our flagship online learning program for how to play guitar. And that's where they approached me was yeah. with that experience in mind. So you know how to do it in other fields, basically. Exactly. Or, okay. So I, I, I ended up um, being lucky enough to be you know, the right person at the right time that they needed. I think that's a perfect example of what I was just talking about. Fender had a problem. Fender had done a bunch of research and found that too many guitar players were dropping out. That if you wired up a bunch of beginner guitars with a small explosive charge and detonated them all at once, Closets and beds would blow up all over America. <laughs> so there was these wonderful people who had good intentions of playing guitar, but for some reason gave it up. Yep. And so they wanted to try and increase that retention rate. This type of online technology was the path they sought, yep. but they didn't know how to do it. Right. So they got you. Right. So. Right. And then what happened? So it grew. You've got, I've been up there now, and I see how many people are working in that side of it. Yeah, yeah. We're actually, uh, we're at uh, just shy of 95,000 users 18 wow. months in, which wow. is very, very exciting. So when, if these people are coming into your organization mm -hmm. and thinking that they'd like to be a part of Fender, if you were looking at them and looking into coming into your department, what are yeah. some of the just traits you'd like throw out? I'd like someone who did had this, this, and this. What are some of the things you'd be looking for in a person that might come in and say, I want to work at Fender, right. Fender Play? Well, my, my department is the, uh, the group I work with is product, product development. And uh, so we've got everything in house from engineers to designers mm -hmm. to uh, curriculum specialists, yeah. folks who write music, who play music, some who don't some who have none of that background. We have um, our, uh, the woman who's our music clearance manager is on my team. What's uh, that she, mean? she comes from music business. But what does music clearance mean? She actually works on all of the song clearances that we uh, obtain in order to have songs on play. So if you yeah, want to use a song. All of the rights to tab, yeah. to you know, perform the music. You can't just like take it and use it. No, you, you can't. actually want to pay somebody you know. for and it. And we're Fender. We're artist friendly. We yeah. support our artists, and yeah. so we're doing it the right way. So if you want to use "Smoke on the Water" by Deep Purple, yep. you've got to find out who wrote it, who's got the publishing, and start. And I'll tell you, that is no small task. We are talking hundreds and hundreds, thousands and thousands of songs that so we try to get. We just had a, one of the students in the earlier session who wanted to be an attorney. Where are you? Are you here? That there you is go. a good lead right there. Yeah. Performance royalty rights. And, and you could find many ways to use that, I think. Yep. Um, so some of those basic skill sets, what kind of people skills would you be looking for? Mm. Uh, we're looking for go-getters uh, because uh, Fender Digital within Fender is it's kind of like a startup. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of startup work where somebody who's willing to just um, take something and run with it. We're taking, looking for folks who take a lot of initiative, mm -hmm. who have a lot of great ideas. Nobody feels like, oh, well, you haven't been around, so you, you can't contribute. It's all about um, new, fresh thinking, um, you know, perspective on the market. If you have it, great. If not, let's test it. Somebody's willing to kind of just go for it and, yeah. and give it a shot. In your organization, a lot of people, I think today, young people especially, want to know when they've done a good job. I mean, define the end zone so you can celebrate when you hit it or know how far you are from it. At Fender Play, how do you define the end zone so people can know whether you're going on the right track? What are the measures along the way that anyone here working there would know, yep, we're going in the right direction? As an organization or as an individual coming into I think it's Fender Play as the group, as the, as the core of what is this division trying to achieve. Yeah. Well, right <clears throat> now, I think um, the biggest thing for us is we're hyper-focused on that retention number. Because mm. as you know, this, I mean, this is all about retaining uh, players, trying to make lifelong learners and players. And so, um, you know, as an organization, that's what we're, that's what we're focused on as an, as an end goal is, mm -hmm. to, is to decrease churn and to increase retention on the program. It's also um, 
you know, obviously engagement, mm -hmm. you know, engagement in our lessons. How are, are people actually actively using it? And um, number one for, for me is, are they learning? Mm -hmm. Does it work? Yeah. You know, and so we look to things like our community. We look at, a, you know, we use a lot of analytics. We use a lot of data. We use a, a ton of, of user research. Mm -hmm. um, so not just on the marketing side to set up the program, but to also build it. Uh, everything is driven by user feedback and uh, what we're seeing out there in terms of the numbers. So if anybody's interested in data and yeah. data analysis, it's yeah. another really very important thing to, yeah. to consider in everything that we're doing. Yeah, I think that's an important element of anyone who's coming into business. There are elements that you're trying to achieve, but at, at the end of the day, there's someone looking down at the whole thing and saying, is it achieving the company's goals? Yeah, exactly. And ultimately they want to you know, create more players and sell more guitars and sell more product and making sure that, that they're growing the whole market. Exactly. And that's really the end zone is, this is a tactic. It's a strategy it to a means to achieve a larger end zone. And more yeah, and I, and I think to that point, it's really not just about Fender Play. When, when we uh, built Fender Play, it was not just about Fender and selling more guitars. It was taking a look at the industry as a whole, seeing a need, trying to fill it, and recognizing that all boats rise with the tide. <laughs> You know, this is this is an industry-wide issue that we're trying to tackle. We're yeah. trying to take the lead on the digital end yeah. to maybe make some changes in yep. the way that things are done. And you know, one day at a time. You know, we'll cool. get there. Yep. So here's what we're going to do. I've got that's kind of a little bit of a manufacturing perspective. <clears throat> now we're going to bring out a retailer. Talk a little bit about more at the retail perspective. <clears throat> and then the third guess is sort of an anomaly of something right in in the middle of what's happening today. And then we'll do a little round robin with everybody. So slide one down, right. Mary. Thank Good you. friend of mine, uh, retailer out of Pennsylvania, Randy Shaler, come on up. <laughs> Zetschwitz Music. All right, For Randy. you. Okay, Randy is like one of these like unbelievably talented, smart, Harvard MBA people. And who was asking, should I get into retail or not? Who was that earlier? Randy did, he bought one, he bought the store. So, you know, one of the things I was thinking about, Randy, tell a little bit about your journey. How did this all happen? Uh, well, it's... Harry, you're way alone over there. Come over here. Come on. Yeah, come yeah, join yeah. us. Uh, I mean, it started with playing <laughs> the clarinet. This is between us. <laughs> yeah. It started with playing clarinet in fifth grade and not playing it very well. And, yeah. And then quitting clarinet and not knowing that I would ever return to music. Although now I appreciate all the great things that that experience did for me. I didn't really appreciate it at the time. Um, when I graduated business school, I uh, started a private equity firm and mm. we were focused in focused on businesses that didn't have a succession plan. There's size of business in the in the industry, in our industry and in all industries, where it's a little bit too big for the employees to take over, a little bit too small for a traditional private equity firm. A lot of baby boomer owners of businesses don't have sons or daughters looking yeah. to take them over. Yeah. And so we were looking to, uh, to to make waves in that space. I found Zeswitz, 93 years old at the time. We're now celebrating our 95th year uh. in business, and it's been a great ride. We've just about doubled the size of the company in the last five and a half years. Um, and I'm, I'm new to the industry, but, but but love it and, and wish I would have found it earlier in my career. And you just dove into the industry head first. Yep. And, and what were the, some of the first things you did when you took over this company? Here's this young kid. Were you really 29? Yeah, 20, 29 when I bought the company. When you bought it and you've got some people there at the music store who've been there for decades. I mean, absolutely. 20, 28 years was the longest at that yeah, point. So, so they instantly took to you, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. And, and all your new ideas. How did you walk into that situation without having in total, you know, alienation? Um, you know, I think the important thing was, you know, we agreed on where we were taking the company, where we were headed, and a lot of those folks stayed around and, and were a part of the growth that they always wanted to see happen in the company. Yeah. And then we brought in a lot of new talent as well and, and, and a lot of fresh faces in the business that have brought outside exposure and outside perspectives to the company as well. And in that marriage of you know, the history of the company and the ethos of what it used to be yeah. with some new talent that, that knows where it, what it could be yeah. has really made us successful. When you were bringing in these new people, what do you look for? What were you looking for? <laughs> if, you're, if you're gonna look at all these resumes that all these people might send you now, and by the way, you should, sorry. Oh, hey, hey anyone hey. who wanna live in Philadelphia, um, yeah, definitely head what up our website. What would you be looking for? What do you want, what would jump out of you and say, ah, oh, that's the person I want? I, the biggest, when I, as I read resumes, especially entry level resumes or early career resumes, the biggest difference I see is folks who um, can understand the impact of what they did. Not folks that, that inflate and, and, and boast too much about what they did, but understand that you know maybe they had an internship and maybe they worked in a, a you know in some kind of a retail store you know rather than said 
buy bag groceries, which may be literally what you did, and and don't inflate that into I was a grocery bagging engineer, but <laughs> but but no, but seriously, but express what that meant. You know, you were the face of the company to the company's loyal customers, and you tried to represent the best that the brand had to offer to its people. I read that on a resume, and then I understand this person kind of gets it, right? They had a small role, but they understood how that small role could make a big impact on the business. Those are the kind of people that we're looking for, and that's the kind of person who's going to grow and who's going to make a big impact on my company. Okay, so let's take that one step further. What are the characteristics of a person who does that? What, what types of people do that? I, I think it's a person that, that uh, just fundamentally knows that they have the, and has the confidence to, 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 to come up with a solution and to make it happen in the real world, but then also has the humility to know that problems don't get solved overnight and that it takes working with other people to, to really be able to solve a problem. And, and it's really it, what it comes down to, I think, Joe, is, is folks that don't accept uh, the status quo, right? It's folks who are kind of uncomfortable with doing things the way that they've always been done. Yeah. Somebody wants to come in and, and, and do it a little bit better every day and a little bit better and kind of shake things up and, and make things grow. That is a, a character trait that will make somebody successful in our industry or in any in industry. Any industry, there. exactly. I think that those are, those are elements that any path in life up, that applies to. I agree. Okay, so you just in, made an interesting point. You reminded me of a story that you told once. <laughs> about going into the warehouse and reorganizing the warehouse. Would you please share that story? Because it's so elemental of how we all approach our lives, you know? Uh, when I bought Zezwitz, when I was, you know, my first day on the job, you know, I found a warehouse that was just really disorganized. And, and many of the folks who had been in the company for a long time, you know, I went and asked them, you know, why don't we have a center aisle? Why are things kind of just all stacked up, you know, on these really disorganized shelves? Oh, well, Randy, the shelves are bolted to the floor. Uh, you know, how, how are we going to, what do you mean center aisle? There is no center aisle. The shelves are bolted down. You say, oh, that's interesting. What, uh, what size wrench do you think you'd need to take those bolts out of the floor? Is, you, is, there, is there a way do you think we could do that? Well, well yeah, I guess there is. Do, do we have a wrench? Can we get a wrench? And so we got a wrench and we unbolted the shelves and we moved them. And everybody stood around and said, wow, that looks a lot better. And we said, yeah. okay, I mean, well, let's do that again. And every day we came into work and we found things like the shelves and we just, we fixed them. Yeah. I mean, that is about the perfect metaphor, I think, for, you know, why is something always the way it is. Well, what size wrench would you need to unbolt that? You know? I think that's a huge opportunity for anyone to become a problem solver yeah. uh, in some, I mean, just kind of an opposite thing. What are the traits that wouldn't get a resume past your desk? I'd be curious on the opposite side, what are things that you see and go, I don't think that person's right for our culture. That wouldn't, wouldn't fit in with the people I'm trying to you know, bring together here. Yeah, um, you know, and I think, well, one thing is just a housekeeping thing. If you have a typo on your resume, it's gonna get thrown away. I know that, I know that from personal experience because I okay, read typos. I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, one of the ways that you communicate your attention to detail and your ability to create something that has quality is with the documents that you send in for a job application. Oh. So if you dropped a comma or misspelled a word or the spacing's a little funky or you didn't quite line up the columns on the left side of the page, that resume is going into the circular file, and 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 that's before I've even looked at what your qualifications may be. Yeah. Um, so so I would encourage you, and I know this is general advice, but but really I'm shocked at how many resumes we see that that have those issues. So produce quality in a resume. If you do that, then I'll know that you can produce quality or that you're capable of producing quality when you come on board. You know, Sandy actually had a, <clears throat> Sandy Felton had a great story that sort of relates to that, which was one of his earlier jobs, they were um, doing a PO or a purchase order for something and, and the amount of money was seemingly small and insignificant, but they were very careful in calculating everything about that purchase and what it might mean and where they were just really aware of every cent that was being spent. And, and you know, someone asked, well, why are you, you know, being so, it's only this size, it's only 50 bucks or whatever. And the response was, if they're that careful with $50, they'll be as careful with $5 million. I, I couldn't <laughs> agree more. I think, yeah. that's, I think that's huge. And so it's the same, same concept. <clears throat> All right, in our speed dating panel here, we're gonna move down one more. <clears throat> and now we've got, uh, and I had the pleasure of meeting this woman in Chicago last month. Uh, when I went to see the uh, Reverb headquarters. Heather Farr Edwards, would you come up please? <laughs> now, those of you who may, how many of you are aware of Reverb? So about, God, about five or, I don't even remember, five or six years ago, 
I went to visit David Colt when he had just purchased Chicago Music Exchange, which is the music store for a guitarist where you would just want to go, lock the door, set up a cot, and never leave, and maybe order pizza once in a while. You'd never want to leave this store. It has everything you'd ever want. And at that time, David was starting this thing called Reverb in about two little rooms in the back of Chicago Music Exchange. They had like a photo booth set up and they were taking some pictures and there was, there was gonna be this website that was gonna hopefully help him sell more guitars, maybe do it better than others like eBay. So when I went there last month to take a look, I thought I might see a few more rooms in the back of Chicago Music Exchange. But no, after touring the store, he said, no, come over here. And I walked across the street and what, what are you on? What avenue are you on? Lincoln Avenue so in North Chicago. Lincoln Avenue in Chicago. Busy, busy city street. And we walk across the street into this whole new building that is Reverb. And I'm going, huh? Wow. And I walked in and saw hundreds of people. Unbelievable. Yeah. So this is a company that's growing very, very quickly. And so one of my thoughts is I want to say, okay, how did you get there? How did you arrive at what you're doing at Reverb? Um, so I actually um, have a journalism degree, and my first internship was with a music magazine based out of New York called Relics Magazine. Mm. Um, so if an, anybody like the Grateful Dead? <laughs> All right, me too. Um, so Relics Magazine's a jam band magazine, and that was my first internship. Really cool experience, just like deep dive into the music industry. Mm -hmm. um, after that, I switched to PR. Um, my thought being that every company needs it so you know i could i could just get my pr skills down and then down the road i could find um, a company that wants to utilize those skills so um i actually was out of the music industry for four or five years so my first job straight out of school um was with a boutique pr agency that did tech and b2b mm. moved on to a bigger pr agency called edelman still doing tech b2b um i thought it was fun you might not think it was as thrilling i was working for data storage clients semi trucks atm machines if you can pitch that to the media, you can pitch anything to the media. Um, like this one puts out money. <laughs> yes. It's very intricate. Um, but the thing that I think is important about my story is that I interned with Relics Magazine in 2009, but I kept freelancing with them. I still do to this day. Um, so I knew that music was something I was interested in. Um, I decided I wanted to kind of get my PR skills mm. down. Um, so I got that through a PR agency. Uh, when a position opened for a PR and communications manager at Reverb, our recruiter, I don't know the magic behind the LinkedIn algorithms, but I'm assuming she Googled music in Chicago and PR and my name popped up, thankfully. Uh, um, and that was because I had this side gig as a music freelance writer. So um, I think that's something really important to keep in mind because I know when I was in college and thinking about getting a job, I thought my first job out of college had to be my dream job. Um, loved my first job, but my dream job was not B2B tech at a really small PR agency. Mm. Um, but because I was able to keep my hand in mm. music, um, at least a, a small amount, um, that helped me I, I didn't have to prove that I was interested in music to get the job at Reverb. They knew because I was doing um, a little bit of music work on the side. So I yeah. think the fact that I was able to build up my skills at an agency, I also had the music interest on the side made me a really good fit for the yeah. position at Reverb. You know, one of the things we were talking about earlier is the point where you say I'm constructively dissatisfied with my first job. While well, you're still there and you're, you're enjoying it, but something in you says, I'm ready for something next. So you made a couple of changes there. What, what, were, what were the catalysts for those changes? People coming to you or you were just like becoming more open to something? Or? Um, that's a good question. So I was only at my first job for one year, which was crazy to my parents who have had the same job for 20, 30 years. They're like, oh, she's a failure. You know, she was only in her first job for a year. Um, but um, I actually moved um, on to something better. So I was, uh, I got prom like technically promoted at the next company and it was a bigger agency. And it was actually through a mentor that I had met um, six years prior. I'd 
I, um, I didn't stalk him, but I kind of stalked him. I just was constantly contacting him, and I moved to Chicago, which is where he lived, not because he lived there. I made myself seem really creepy. That is, that is uh, kind of like stalking. <laughs> these are, those are separate uh, things. <laughs> Um, but he, there, there was eventually a point where he was able to offer me a job, um, so it was a step up. Um, and then I actually left um, that job before I came to Reverb on really good terms because it was one of those things where I said, you know, I really love working here. I love my boss. I love this company. But, um, you know, my passion is music. And they said, we understand that we can't offer you that. And so it was a really good um, scenario. But I think that, you know, you should feel enabled to make those moves, not because you feel bad or you feel, um, you're, I mean, hopefully you have a good relationship with your boss everywhere that you work, um, but you have to make those moves for you. So if you get an opportunity in a better position or at a better company, um, you, you have to take it. Yeah. When I walked into Reverb, what I felt immediately was there was a culture there. It was something that David and, and the team had created. Everyone was busy, they were, there was energy there, there was sort of a very forward thinking, uh, just you could feel it. What did, how would you describe the atmosphere at Reverb? What is it like to work in that environment? Um, it's really fun. It's really fast paced. Um, I think if you are somebody who kind of just wants to like come punch in your time card, do a little work, take a long lunch, <laughs> mosey back in, punch your time card out. Um, it's not really a good place for you. I don't think you would be happy and I don't think we would be happy. But the California <laughs> Department of Motor Vehicles is hiring for people just like well, that. So they, if you're you know, there, go to California, for work for the DMV. <laughs> They're wide open. Yeah. Okay. Um, but it's, a, I mean, I am, um, I'm pretty type A. Um, I am very competitive. Um, I like to, you know, set goals and achieve them. And I think that that's kind of the general um, feeling at Reverb and it's a good place to do so. Um, we have 200 people now, um, about 180 are in Chicago. The rest are spread um, internationally. But um, I think that the general feeling is that regardless of what level you're at or what department you're in, if you have an idea, raise your hand, you can go get it done. And I think that there's a good chunk of people who are really looking for something like that, um, especially uh, the people that I graduated with, or I, I talk sometimes to universities in Chicago and you know they don't just want to, to go to a job they want to go somewhere and they want to build something and um, it feels at reverb you know like we're all building something together yeah. and I think that the, the people who work there stay there because of that that is exciting the, the actually building something together I mean how many people I asked earlier how many want to do something that's bigger than themselves and everyone said yes so these are most how many are in college again okay this is this is largely these people are in college a little round robin here just to kind of check this out Mary, if you could remember one thing from college, what is it? Oh, that's tricky. <laughs> Related to this session. Well, let's start with that. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> one thing from college um, that helped to guide my career. Yeah. I think um, you mentioned mentorship. I think that's probably one of the most uh, impactful things that I took away from my college experience was the ability to find one or two key mentors who helped to guide me in that next step. It's very scary to leave college yeah. and not know what's next and to think, oh my God, I'm on my own. And if you're like, well, if my mom gave me a set of luggage when I graduated, so that was a real sign <laughs> that I needed to do it. So, um, you know, having that, being able to go out on your own is great and powerful and wonderful, but it's okay to ask for help. And um, having a real key mentor to do that, um, you know, is something that will, it's stuck with me forever. How did you get a mentor? I, I got, I was very involved at school. I'm also very type A, uh, very, uh, I had a need uh, and a desire to really get experience even while I was at school. And so I did a lot of, you know, uh, organizing of uh, student events. And so, um, you know, volunteering down in orphanages in Mexico and taking students down and things like that. So I, I, that's really how I found my mentors. I reached out actively to people at the university who were running these types of programs okay. and said, and raised my hand, said, I'm willing to do it. So I can school. do it. 
Yep. It was cool. Yep. Andy, what do you remember from school that might be applicable to what you're doing today? Um, well, first thing, school was the, college at least, was the first time I'd really had any real leadership experience with uh, just organizations. So I, I would applaud any of you that have stepped up to take a leadership role in any of the clubs and organizations you're all involved in. But just a quick show of hands, if I may, how many in this people in this room have taken an economics course? Nice. I hope every hand goes up, and especially just because I think economics is just a way to understand everything behind us. Um, that's super important. And then the next thing is if you are actually going to be involved in any for-profit uh, part of our industry, I would really encourage you all to take a, an accounting course. You know, if you were going to go live in a foreign country, you'd take a language in that country. Accounting is the language of business. You got to know what profit is, cash flow is, um, uh, what EBITDA is. If you, those all have very specific definitions, if you if you know what those are, you'll be uh, able to have much more higher level and more important conversations within any for profit organization you choose to enter. So those things you're using today. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So like what any classes that you remember that you're using something from today at Reverb? Anything that do you remember from your journalism major or other things you might have taken? Well, are there teachers in the audience? Hmm? Are there instructors in the audience? Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, you might not like this, but I learned almost everything I do now on the job. But that being said, there are a lot of really core skills that are going to be important no matter what job you do. I think writing is one of those things. Yep. Even if you're not going to be in marketing and communications, you're probably going to be sending emails or maybe you're going to be writing descriptions for a product or um, well, I guess in, in both of your cases. Um, I think that um, getting comfortable speaking publicly uh, is terrifying. I understand that most people do not like that. Um, but if you're able to get over that, even just in front of groups of small people, um, eventually when you get to a point where you're able to give a presentation or um, talk to a group of leadership in a company, just knowing how to navigate that is important. Um, and I think um, I went to a school that was really focused on liberal arts. And I think that my psychology classes that taught me just about how to understand people and interact with people, all of those are things that are going to be applicable, even if you try to go into um, a company where you think you're not going to talk to anybody all day, like you're going to be talking to people, you're going to be writing. So even if you're kind of up in the air about what it is exactly you need to do, those basic level skills are going to be important no matter what it is you end up doing. Cool. So we got one more question I'll do a round, and, and this one is going to um, take a page out of what most young people would find is one of the most educational media um, events of our last you know, period of time would be, of course, South Park. I'm talking about South Park. <laughs> the idea of Captain Hindsight. Mostly people are about to be graduating in just a few months. And uh, let's put on our Captain Hindsight, of course, which was the hero who jumps in at any disaster and says, I now know how we could have avoided this entire thing. <laughs> so now you're looking back at yourself in January before graduation, late January, early February, what would you have told yourself as you were about to graduate and enter the world? I mean, not your mom saying, I'd like more luggage. I mean, <laughs> right, right. what would you be thinking? Let's start with you, Randy, on this one. Um, Captain, Captain Hindsight has the microphone. <laughs> yeah, uh, so Captain Hindsight, uh, I was stressed out. Well, I was stressed out about student loans. Uh, yeah, that's one thing to get stressed out about. And, you know, those get paid back, and that's okay. No, I was stressed out at, you know, at graduation or this time of my senior year about just putting a lot of pressure to know what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Like, I got to figure this out. I'm graduating. I need to know what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And I'm 34. I don't know. I still don't know what I want to do for the rest of my life. I feel like I'm headed in the right direction and I, I'm challenging myself in my current role and I'm learning. And, and that's, I think, what I, my former self, my Captain Hindsight, I would have told myself, <laughs> just, just find a role where you, where you get, where you're excited, where you're going to learn that you're headed in the direction of where you see yourself yeah. being. And don't put so much pressure on, on like picking your, where you're going to be. You didn't in have to years. know it all right no, then. No, go go to a job, go find it, try it for a while, see if it works, and and then take the next step after that. Yeah, Heather, Captain Hindsight. Yeah, I I mean I agree with that 100. percent I think when I graduated, I was really concerned with finding a position that matched the skills I already had. So the skills that I was able to build up through internships or through courses or whatever it is. But what I really should have been focused on is okay, these are the skills that I have, but what do I really want to learn? Because your first job out of college 
again, it's probably not going to be your end all be all dream job. If it is, that is great. Um, but if it's not, then just do everything you can to learn everything you can, um, whether it's you want to learn more. I mean, for me, it was I wanted to learn more about social media. I wanted to learn more um, about reaching out to the media. And I was getting that in a way that wasn't related to something I was technically interested in. But everything, I mean, you can maneuver anything to be applicable yep. to where you want to head down the line. So, I, I mean, I would just agree with you wholeheartedly don't stress out about that first job because you're probably not going to be there forever yep mary captain hindsight yeah to, uh, well and to echo what they've said um that was the first thought that i had was um i you know if i were able to sit down and talk to myself i'd say do you know that i majored in psychology as an undergraduate i went on to study international relations as in my postgraduate work and I do not work in international relations. I ended up going on to get an instructional technology degree and I work in the music industry. I would have never thought in a million years that that's where I would have ended up. But there was one thing that I really wish I would have thought of and that is what, how do I wanna live my life? Not just in terms of the work, but in terms of my life. Do I want to travel? Do I want to have kids? Do I want to have a family? Those are just as important as thinking about those mm. big skills than that big salary and everything that you want to do. It's about how you want to live your life and who you want to be. Wow. Awesome. How'd they do, guys? All right? <clears throat> Mary, Randy, Heather, thank you so much, you guys. All right. Everyone here, this combined with seeing the NAMM show and all the exhibits and all the music, this is going to be a full couple days for you. And it's really going to take a little bit to think through and really sift out what are the meaningful bits. But we just heard some wonderful bits, I think. So how many of you still, you know, when we raise hands about we're all passionate about music, how many of you are pursuing a career in music and want to be a performer? I mean, I think that was the glue that held all of us together and I think it still is the glue that anyone on that show floor over a certain age, regardless of who they're working for, what they're doing, what they really wanted was to be in the Beatles. And it didn't work out. So now they're in the Yamaha booth or then over here. But that's what bound us all together was a love of music and that we really wanted to live it. Our next guest is actually doing just that. <clears throat> I met this young man in Washington, D.C. Both of us are walking around in suits talking to legislators, pushing for music education funding. And then he tells me about his rap video with Florida, and I had to sit down. So before I go any further, could I bring out music producer, entrepreneur, unbelievably young, impressive man, Jay Dash. <laughs> I mean, where did you come from? I mean, like, where did you grow up? What planet did you <laughs> Jay Dash, these are my friends. Thank you. These are from colleges all over. We have some from China even. And so many of them love what we all stand for, which is music and music making and the world being musical. And, and so you're involved right now in a music career. So I'm going to talk about some of the other things that you're doing as well. But well, well, wait. Before we start, forgive me for this. <laughs> Can you guys look to like the left up here look to the right up in this area look at all the signs this massive arena and realize that this entire show was put together <laughs> by 60 people <laughs> did you know that there are over 7,000 brands right two million square feet with a team of 60 people what you guys do uh, is the most incredible thing i have ever seen in my life <laughs> i have never seen no listen listen black white, yellow, green, Islam, Christian, Sikh, it, Jew, it doesn't matter. I've never seen so many people in one place for the common goal. This is not what we all dream. Is this not what we dream of? We are. This is here. This doesn't happen anywhere. So first of all, y'all give a huge round of applause to Joe and his team. Oh, man. Thank you, This Jay. is amazing. Thank you, Jay. Amazing. So... That being how said, did, I'll let you How did this breath. happen? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. This is cool. Well, how old were you started? How old when you started in music? How old was I when I started yeah, in music? Yeah. Um, the answer to that is every day. Like from <laughs> I started music every memory, day. Every I feel memory. like every day it feels like completely new. 
uh, to me. And that's how you kind of, the way I like to put it is I wake up and I go to sleep and then I do stuff in between. And it's what you do in that in between time that really defines who you are. I started picking up piano at the age of like four or five. Yeah. Um, I, I was supposed to be like taking lessons. My mom put me in piano lessons and I played so well by ear that I never really learned how to read music very well. So I would have my teacher play the song, you know, before and then yeah. I would memorize it and keep going. Um, so, yeah, I started around five, four or five years old. Yeah. Encouraging parents. I mean, did you have encouragement around you? I do. I do not come from a musical family at all, but I did have a lot of encouragement to, to grow in music. Yeah, and that was a big part of That was important to you? Absolutely. To, to be encouraged, to have someone who was encouraging you along the way to do this. Absolutely. Absolutely. To, to know, I think the most important thing <clears throat> over anything is to know that there are options. Yeah. I think there are a lot of kids out there that just, they, they don't realize all the opportunities that are available in this industry. Um, and just exposing people to options will really, really help in your career. Like, oh man, I can do that like better than that guy you know why am i not doing that so uh just exposure so exposure is important so along the way you started meeting some different people in the industry and how did people help you along how did someone help you develop your career make some choices here or there or were you more self-directed in your career how do you think these developed it's been a little of both to yeah. be honest i think there are moments when i i kind of admittedly cut myself off and was more self-directed and honestly, those are the times I felt like I moved the slowest, right? When you have a mentor and somebody available to kind of point you in a direction that doesn't really tell you exactly what to do, but these are the opportunities that are available, mm -hmm. that's when you end up growing the most. Yeah. And how old were you when you started thinking about this as a career? I mean, when you realized that this could actually be your thing? I think I was 14 years old, and I heard a song by Timbaland uh, up jumps the boogie, and I said, I don't know what that is, but I'm doing that. <laughs> but I want some of that. Forever. Like, whatever that is, yeah. Well, okay, that, that sound, I mean, we've all had those moments, but you took it and did something with it. What were some of the things you did to make those steps, little steps along the way, I'm guessing, little iterations along the way? Did you start composing right away? Did you start mixing right away? What were some of the things you did to get that forward move that forward i started from with a dream like, to a reality yeah i started with like the the first version of like fruity loops i could find and get on my computer i started producing um and then i started working with other people i would like really embarrass myself a lot admittedly go out and play like really really bad music for people but really listen to why it was bad and like learn from that and keep iterating on it until i got better and better until yeah. i was like found artists that i wanted to grow with right uh, find people that I liked working with and continue to grow from there. It's a really cool experience to see the people around you grow. So like, I used to go to record pool meetings with, I don't know if you guys have heard of them, you ever heard of Plies or Flo Rider or Briscoe, Rick Ross? We used to all go to record pools and like open for each other and, and all that. And then all of a sudden you just go off in different directions and, and grow. But it's really cool because the common thread between all that is hustle. So it doesn't matter what it is that you're doing, like go hard, like go harder than everybody else in the room. And like, don't really necessarily compare yourself to people, compare yourself to the people that are at the top, but grow with the people around you. I think those two things are important. If you can grind, a lot of people are just lazy. They're lazy. And you came up in a time, you were, first of all, this guy's an amazing drummer. No, no. An amazing drummer. And you came up in a time when people felt like, oh, well, music is real. I used to hear that a lot, like a lot of live music, music is real. Mm -hmm. And then things went, you know, very digital. But digital is just a tool, right? And it either, some people use it as a crutch, right? And can't really play. But the people that are like really well versed in music, yeah. they use it as like, you now have an extra limb, right? So use the tools that are available to you and just grow. But still okay. write songs tell stories. Absolutely. Have a human interaction through the Absolutely. music. Absolutely. Yeah. So what were the first big breaks, would you call, were there breaks along the way, like forks, and you go, ah, I'm going this way. Any big breaks that kind of like happened magically yep. or through your own hustle, hard work? Yep, I remember I was at, uh, first of all, I went to the University of Florida and I majored in computer science. The first break that I had was at UF and we had a stadium called the O'Connell Center and Lil Wayne and Fabulous were performing. Mm -hmm. And the guy, the promoter that put it on, just because I had been in his ear for like six months, was like, hey, do you want to open? 
I was like, hell yeah, I want to open. Why hell do I want to? So so, what do you mean Ben in his ear? You just kept calling him and saying. I just, I recognized that he had a hustle, that he was a guy that was moving. And I didn't know how we would ever help each other in the industry at all. But I was yeah. just like, you know, just stay I'm around Jay. people that are moving. Hi, yeah, I'm like, that's it. <laughs> what do you need? How can I help? What do, what do you need? That's it. <laughs> Absolutely. So and what happened? So you got the um, gig? Yeah, I opened up for Lil Wayne and Fabulous in front of 20,000 people. Yeah. That was like really my first time on a stage. How old were you? I was 19. <laughs> yeah. Describe that moment walking out on stage. Um, terrifying. <laughs> it was completely terrifying. Yeah. I was, uh, I realized I was like, man, I don't know if my music is going to sound as good as these. I, I worried about too much stuff. Um, but I went there and just did me, and it, it worked out. You so. just pushed. You yeah. just, no going backwards. There's no going back from What me. happened after that? Um, more shows. Um, a friend, <laughs> a couple of friends and I, we used to like dance in clubs a lot. And then we used to do this dance to other people's songs. And a friend of mine, his name's Fleazy, he was like, yo, man, we need to make a song for this dance. Because every time we would do it, people would be like, oh, man, I want to learn that. What is that? What is that called? What are y'all doing? So I went back to my <laughs> dorm room and I get on my computer. I had GarageBand, the old Apple computer. And I was just like, you know, just fiddling around with it. And I made the beat for the WAP in my dorm room. And I had like a little mic set up in the corner with like the egg crate foam on the walls. <laughs> and I just like recorded in the corner. I recorded the vocals for it. And then I like basically took that, got it cleaned up. And I had a couple friends of mine who danced, made a video. This is at a, uh, at a time when YouTube was like, like first popping off. People were like not really there yet. Mm -hmm. And so I just like, I really had them put a video on YouTube just so I could show other people. Like, oh, listen to the song I did, right? And that was it. And then I left it for like three months. I didn't even go back to it. I came back three months later to look at the video. It had half a million views. And I was like, is this uh, right? I think YouTube is broke. Like something's <laughs> wrong with it. And uh, then after that, I was like, yo, I called a friend of mine who worked for Ozone Magazine at the time. And he, I was like, yo, man, I think I might have something, but I have no idea what to do. I was the guy that was like the dog that chases cars. Yeah. Just don't know what to do when you, you catch one. one. <laughs> and I finally caught one. I was like, I was t even more terrified. And this and is so, your song. It's my song. You wrote it. I wrote you it. You just put it out I there. I produced it. Put it out there. Did you get it like copywritten or anything? Or like worried about someone yeah, know, yeah, stealing yeah. it? Or just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I copywrote it, you know, paid my little $35 or whatever it is to the government. Mm -hmm. And that was it, man. Put it out there and it, it just took off. So it was really cool. So then what happened? Then what happened? <laughs> oh, man. So we took it from half a million views. And then I was like, yo, man, what am I supposed to do with this? He was like, oh, man, that's easy. We're going to take it into such and such, such and such. So having somebody that like had an in with different companies, different decision makers, was really, really helpful for me because I didn't know what I was doing, man. Was I was just out there guy? making music. Who was he, a friend of yours or something? He's, he became my manager. His name's uh, Malik Abdul. Uh, um, and he became my manager, and we've been together ever since. Wow. Um, and so we took that, and we you know, just started booking shows. So I started putting money in my pocket, and, uh, and that was it. And then it went viral the first time on YouTube. The second time, uh, Miley Cyrus was twerking in a unicorn onesie, and it was crazy because I went to sleep. Hold on, well, say that one more time. So, <laughs> let me explain. So Cyrus, twerking. Cyrus was what? So let me tell you what twerking is. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. All right, uh, so. Yeah, so, help, help explain it to me. Here. So <laughs> I went to bed one I just night. rolled off his tongue a little too easily. I just yeah, wanted to say, yeah. did you say what I thought he said? Okay. Here's the whole Please, story. I digress. Go on. <laughs> I, I woke up, and, I, and all of a sudden my phone just started, like, going off. Bzz, 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 and I was like, what the hell is going on? Because it's like 2 a.m. And I look at the phone, and... All of a sudden, like a whole bunch of people were tagging me on Twitter. And I was like, what the heck is going on? And then I look at my DMs and Miley Cyrus was in my DMs. Like, yo, this record you got, wow, man, I love this. I was like, word? Did you get hacked? Is this Miley? Is this you for real? She was like, yeah, man, I love this song. This is awesome. I was like, okay, cool. We chopped it up for a little bit on, on Twitter. And then like, I just thought that was a cool conversation. Kept it moving. Wake up the next day. Miley Cyrus is in like a onesie on Good Morning America. They, start, they picked up the video and they were like playing it on national TV. And I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> Caught oh, another car. Oh, <laughs> man. Then it went viral again. I went from, because I had already sold 500,000 units. It went gold at that point. I went from half a million to my first platinum record in like 20 days. 
it was insane, man. So it was it was awesome. I've been I've been blessed in that respect. Catching a rocket. Catching a rocket, man. And, you, and, and from there, man, it's just. So been, were you still in school then, or were you already out working? I was still in school. <laughs> Not only was I in school. <laughs> Did you go to class this. the next day after this oh, conversation yeah. oh, with yeah. Miley Cyrus? Oh yeah. <laughs> Listen, when I say I was Can shook. You imagine this guy in class the next day after just having this. Yeah. Well, people didn't know it was me, yeah, yeah. and so like I'm I'm the guy that like I don't really put push myself out there like that and so like i would go to class and just sit down and work <laughs> dude i had a job where i was working in a cubicle right nobody knew i did music right now being in the computer engineering field and as soon as i got out of college right i went into this job with a railroad company and i'm working in a cubicle and the first thing i did when i got there was i built an app so i could do my job from my phone right what was crazy is because I would travel nights and weekends to different cities, but I was on call. And so they would call me and be like, hey, Jay, it's like four in the morning. Hey, can you restart this server? Can you do this? This is happening. Oh, OK, cool. So I would like I would do that from my phone. I literally was in I remember Lafayette, Louisiana. <laughs> I'm standing off stage. Right. I have like all my, my gear on. I'm good to go. The club is going crazy. People are going. And dog, I got a call at 1.30 a.m. And I was like, oh, man, it's the job. I have a microphone in one hand. I have my phone in the other hand. They were like, hey, man, the server's down. I restarted the server. I was like, okay, cool. One second. I restarted the server from the phone. And then I was like, all right, cool. Bet. Hey, yo, what up? This J Dash, baby. We bet. It was crazy. It was awesome, though. That, that was the moment I was like, yeah, I'm going to like be Bruce Wayne and Batman for as long as I can. Did anyone know awesome. back in the office that this was happening? They didn't know till I was in USA Today. <laughs> I was like the artist on the verge in USA Today. So did and HR come down to the It was the <laughs> weirdest day of my life because I really don't like that attention. Like, I enjoy making music. I enjoy being able to eat off of it. But I didn't want to, like, not be able to go to the grocery store, right? And so, like, <laughs> it was one day. I was in USA Today. And, you know, the people at my job read USA Today. And all of a sudden, they were like, is that... <laughs> <laughs> that same guy that works back on the sixth floor in the queue. <laughs> With a little ID card. It was so strange because they started bringing their kids to the office to, like, take pictures and stuff. And I'm in, like, you know, business cash, you know what I'm saying, in the work attire. Dog. But it was, it was really strange. But it was real cool after that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So having that career while doing all the computer work also led you to be an entrepreneur on another side. Let's talk about that for a second. I mean... Yeah, We're so walking down Capitol Hill, and he's telling, oh, I also have a uh, software business. <laughs> like, <what? laughs> so, I, I mean, I love technology as much as I love music. I think there is a really, really strong correlation between tech and music. So if you really, really like music and get music, try coding. It's a lot of the same muscles. Uh, so I, I would advocate by saying that. Um, I work now with a company in Austin, Texas called Everly Well. Um, and they're basically trying to disrupt the healthcare space by being, you know, giving you the ability to own your own health. So any test you could take at a lab, Quest, or you know, whatever lab that you're going to, you can take those tests from home now. You go to everlywell.com. You can order a test. Um, it's all done online, you know, completely, you know, private and everything. And they use the same partner labs that Quest and all of them use. So it's 100% safe to use. It is an amazing company and I'm just really glad to be a part of it. You're a part of the company. You yeah. are a part of the company. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How do you find the time? How do you divide up your schedule? How do you keep track of being able to manage all these plates spinning in the air? You know, I try not to think about it. Um, <laughs> if, just, I, if just, I do. Just, just lean forward and go? Yeah, I just, I just go, man. I, I, things that I'm passionate about, if you're passionate about anything, you can take it anywhere. And that's what's really cool is you may be like, oh, I'm really passionate about art or I'm passionate about science, or you can be passionate about anything in any space, right? As long as you take that passion with you, you'll be good. Yeah. So that's, that's really what it's been for me. I just took the passion that I had for music, just applied it to technology, and it, and it works the same way. You know, what made you come to Washington with us? What made you decide on your own time to come to lobby for music education? Well, music education was a big part of my life. Um, it helped me realize that there were options. I played in the high school band. I was on the drum line when I was in high school. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I played quads. I don't know what y'all play. Come on, somebody. So, um, yeah, I, I did that. My band director, uh, Marcus Young, he was really instrumental in giving me discipline mm -hmm. and, you know, just giving me a way, like, structure and understanding that there was more to music. Um, gave me an interest in theory, right? Um, and so it was really cool, man. I really appreciated it. But 
you know, my mother, being as practical as she was, was like, that's not going to pay the bills. I was like, oh, Lord, all right. So I got I to gotta figure out something else to do. So that's when I, you know, computers was the only other thing I really understood. I majored in that. But let me tell you, when I was in college, I loved, I loved music so much that they, we had like a piano lab at UF, right? And at night, I would sneak into the piano because I didn't have access. So I'd wait for somebody to open the door. And then I would like grab my hand in. I would sneak into the piano rooms. And they had like different rooms. Each room had a piano. And there were like music majors in there. And I would sit in the piano room. And I would listen to people on the other side of the wall. And I'd be like, man, that sounds really good. And I would literally sit there and try to pick out the notes they were playing. And make, I would be in there for hours mm. trying to figure out how they were playing, what they because they were in there practicing, you know. And so I'm like, if they're practicing, I'm going to practice what they practice. And that's how I started picking up theory, yeah. not being in music college, yeah. but just having a hunger. And so when people tell you to hustle and to grind, there is no like way to do. There's not going to be a path for that. It's just got to be in you, right? It's just got to be like I'm going to do whatever. I don't care how I look. I don't care what it takes. Yeah. I'm getting there. And the people that are going to be mentors in your life, the people that are great leaders are not the people that say, hey, I want you to do what I tell you to do. They're the people that say, hey, we're going over here. Mm -hmm. Right. As long as they have a goal that I can follow, Mm -hmm. that's a great leader. So having great mentors that are great leaders in your life, as well as having that hunger, those are the two keys you need to win. You told a story while we're on Capitol Hill, one of the receptions that I just it blew me away because. You think about the world today and the way politics are going, the way everything's pretty screwed up in so many ways, and yet all these young people are coming up wanting to be optimistic and wanting to be a part of the solution. <clears throat> you said something about where problems get solved and how not to let something up here change your ability to just do what you can do. You remember that story? Absolutely. Would you share that again? I just thought that was just a quick one, but it just... I think it would empower everyone here to basically put the blinders on and say, screw all that, just do your thing. Right, 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 right. So basically the gist of that story was that there was a mountain, um, a mountain tribe, and there was like a forest tribe. So just think there's two tribes, right? And uh, the, the forest tribe, you know, didn't know how to get to the mountains, but the mountain tribe came down, raided the, the I said the forest, the valley tribe, right? They came down, they raided the valley tribe, and they took a baby took one of the people's baby and went back up to the mountains. So the Valley Tribe gathered a team of men together, the strongest men, to go figure out, you know, how we got to go get this baby back. And they navigated for days through the woods, could not figure out how to get to the mountain. There was no path for them to do it. There was no way for them to get there. They struggled and struggled and struggled, could not get to the top of the mountain. So after days, they came back, heads down, defeated, and they were like, There's no way we can get up there. They're trying to explain to the people why they couldn't get the baby back. And all of a sudden, somebody said, hey, look, what's that up the mountain? And they look, and they see one woman coming down the mountain. And they were looking like, who is that? And the woman was holding the baby. And they were like, oh, my God. How did you do it? Our best guys could not navigate the way to the mountain. How did you, by yourself, Get the baby back. And she answered (laughs) with four simple words. It's not your baby. That was the mom. And there was nothing that was going to stop her from getting her baby. And so I made that speech because I felt like when we went to Washington, D.C., nobody's going to care about education and music like us. It's our responsibility to, to bring that to the forefront because that's our baby, yeah. right? So that's, we have to take ownership of that. We have to travel that mountain yeah. that's unnavigable and bring our baby back. And the take home is that every one of you, that's your baby. <laughs> that's your baby. And look at that, it is five o'clock. We have hit our time and I think we are done. She's shaking her head done. Could I hear it for our special guest, Jay Dash? Thank you.